So good evening and thank you very much. I really do appreciate, especially those of you who have logged on to several of my lectures. This is the last of the season. You'll be glad to know I've already begun work on next season and I'm researching every single casualty lost by Linlithgow in World War II. This is my place of establishment for some 33 years, the same number of years that Jesus Christ was alive on earth. And believe me, sometimes it felt like it. I remember fondly when I was teaching here, trying to get the class to buy a class photograph and they weren't selling that well and the school wasn't getting a profit. So I held one up and I said, look, in a few years time, 2030, you'll take this out, show it to your children and say, there's Jeannie Brown, she's a brain surgeon. There's Peter Rogers, he's a space scientist. And a wee voice from the back of the class shouted out, aye, and there's old Jimison, he's deed. This is a school, as some of you will remember it, before asbestos was discovered. And of course, they had to almost knock the place down. I taught for several years in a prefabricated second floor shed. And over those years, which included eight as principal examiner in history for Scotland, I collected many answers given by history students to set exam questions, both during prelims and in the actual exams themselves. The responses sometimes made me frown, sometimes uh, made me uh, aghast, but often they made me grin or even occasionally laugh out loud. Let's call them gaffes or classroom clangers, but I don't much like the word howler, a term often used to describe a very stupid or glaring mistake, although sometimes an amusing one. Like those shown here, Sir Francis Drake circumcised the world with a 100 foot flipper. <laughs> which was very dangerous to all his men. Or, or a mosque is a sort of church. The main difference is that its roof is doomed. I often think that these are very contrived. I'm always suspicious about commercial compilations of so-called schoolboy and schoolgirl howlers. Are they really genuine? Take, for example, this student response, supposedly. The government of England was a limited mockery. Henry VIII found walking difficult because he had an abbess on his knee. When Queen Elizabeth exposed herself before her troops, they all shouted hurrah. Then our navy went out and defeated the Spanish armadillo. Really? Are these genuine? They always sound to me rather contrived, but I guarantee the ones I shall present tonight are totally genuine. I personally never ever laughed at a pupil's efforts to their face anyway or even meaningfully embarrassed any student. I may have smiled and used the misinterpretation of a historical fact as a way to get the student to understand what had gone awry and to improve next time. Sometimes the mistake was mine. I had made a joke or an offhand remark in class thinking it would be understood by everyone. When that joke was repeated in a class test, I realized that a lot of things we take for granted about a teenager's comprehension of the past is misplaced. Some pupils obviously took what I said seriously and literally and repeated it. One common misconception, especially among primary pupils, was chronology. I lost track of the number of times a little hand shot up and asked me, what did I do in the First World War? I mean, can you spot me in this 1916 photograph? I don't think so. I retired from teaching in the year 2007, memorably receiving a card from my last form class with the message, we are sorry you are living. I thought that was appropriate, given the many spelling mistakes I had witnessed in my teaching career. At least, I hoped it was a mistake. I often wondered what many of my pupils made of a history teacher. Did they see any relevance in the subject being taught? viewing it through the eyes of a young person with no real history of their own. I got most feedback about what they thought when pupils were asked to comment on a secondary source, that is a piece of work written by a historian. Here are some genuine, I think, revealing responses to this item. This was a, an old grade, sorry, an old, yes, an old grade item in 2008. How useful is source B for explaining the impact of World War I on Scottish politics? And source B, which you can read there, was written by historian Neil Oliver in 2010. This must have been a later exam. One pupil's response was, genuinely, source B is useful 
as it was written by a history writer who won't want to look stupid by writing crap history. Uh, I wrote on that pupil's exam paper, mm, interesting, I, I get your meaning, but do watch your language and try to ex express an opinion more like source B is useful as it was written by an eminent historian who will have carefully researched all the evidence. Other responses to that same item included, source B was written by a man who wasn't there, so it's useless. Hmm. In that case, I had to remind the scholar that I too was a historian and the author of many books, and that I did not consider my evidenced opinion as worthless. Yet another response, and one I liked much better, was this could be useful, as it was written by a man who I seen on the telly, and he seems to know what he's on about. Well, I know that all of our fronted programmes like Two Men in a Trench coast in Scotland's history, but sometimes, to be honest, I did wonder if he really did know what he was on about. Another pupil was rather self-deprecating, in addition to being rather um, uncomplimentary to Mr. Oliver. This source is useless, as neither the man who wrote it or myself were there, so what I think counts for nothing. Shades of Henry Ford and history is bunk, I thought. I pointed out to the candidate that the whole art of history is to try and recapture the past through the use of relevant primary material and deeply researched interpretation by historians to arrive at a balanced answer. But I sometimes did wonder where students got their information from. Scottish history was particularly fraught with problems as the pupils, mostly Scots, knew something of their nation's past, but often not a lot, or it had grown legs in the telling. Here are some genuine written comments collected over the years from the topic, the Scottish Wars of Independence. The Scots army lined up at the right of the River Stirling next to the Orchid Hills. Uh, I think he was referring to the river, uh, the, sorry, to the Battle of Stirling Bridge fought in 1297, close to the Ochil Hills. The Scottish nobles made William Wallace an escaped goat, or perhaps a scapegoat, meaning that when it suited their purpose, the Scots nobles declared Wallace an outlaw who could be killed without a trial. The next one appealed on several levels. William Wallace was talked about by a blind Harry who wandered all round Scotland without ever seeing William for himself. Blind Harry, of course, was a wandering minstrel who traveled Scotland, including a visit to Linlithgow Palace, telling tales of William Wallace. And that occurred 200 years after Wallace died. Such answers could stress an already harassed history teacher, so it helped me to smile as I read the next gem. In the Middle Ages, books were written on Valium instead of paper. Thank you, Jean. I think you mean vellum, which was specially prepared animal skin. Valium is an antidepressant. Sometimes I realise why a student had chosen history uh, and not geography. Uh, for example, in the 20th century, new technology was used in shipbuilding in many places on the Clyde, such as Drum Chapel and Bishop Riggs. I quietly pointed out that both these places, while being reasonably close to the Clyde, are actually not on the river, so shipbuilding would have been rather problematic. Sometimes I knew what a student was trying to say, it was just the way they said it. Take, for example, Scottish miners were happy when they got rid of all young children and replaced them with ponies. My response was, I think you're referring to the 1842 Mines and Collieries Act, which prohibited all underground work for girls and for boys under 10. Instead of getting children to pull heavy trucks along the mine shafts, some mine owners installed railway tracks and used pit ponies to pull the trucks along. On the same British history topic, here's another genuine misunderstanding. Miners took a small bird with them down the mines, and when there was a bad smell, it sniffed it, snuffed it, and fell off its perch. That was a sign to get out. I told that youngster that he was on the right track. Miners did carry a canary in a cage down the mine to help them detect gas. The birds were more sensitive to carbon monoxide than humans, and I suppose that if a lot of gas was present, the bird would uh, 
fall off its perch. The, the, the pupil looked a bit upset, so I quickly added that the bird could be resuscitated using the apparatus shown on the top right. On a similar theme, I once received this. New breeds of parrot were invented to smell for leaks. You have to look at the spelling on the screen. If there was a bad leak, the parrot died first. I explained, uh, I, I was perhaps a little bit sarcastic, uh, and I asked, was it a Welsh coal mine that the bird was looking for leaks in? Forgive me. One sometimes thorny subject was the reasons for 19th century population explosion. And one lad had a ready answer. There was a population explosion between 1800 and 1840 because they had no TV. This actually came from a very talented lad, an excellent artist in funds, and I warned you of this. In fact, he drew this cartoon of me on the left. And yes, I did once look like that. He was, however, a cheeky chap. I remember during one lesson, he was continually playing the fool, pretending he wasn't as bright as I knew he was. I eventually lost patience and shouted, lad, you are nothing but a pantomime character, to which he immediately replied, oh, no, I'm not. Anyway, back to his cheeky answer on population rise. I said to him that I could see where he was coming from, but there were other explanations as to why the UK population doubled from 1800 to 1840. Here's another genuine answer. One reason for the increase in the Scottish population was that they had more food, so they had more energy to make babies. Also, advances in medicine stopped the spreading of affection. I detected a contradiction there. Again, I could see what was meant and tactfully agreed that better nutrition was indeed a factor which helped to see an increase in the population. Also, I think he meant infection. I directed the student to a Times educational website and she did look it up. And in fact, at the next lesson, she pointed out a spelling error in this official Times publication. I do not think that aesthetics played any part in helping the population explosion. Spelling was always a problem for many students. I am now very aware now of dyslexia or congenital word blindness, but it wasn't in my early teaching days something we talked about, and I always corrected spelling. Here are some genuinely misspelled words that I came across in history exam answers. But sometimes one of these mangled words made me realize that I could not take for granted that students knew exactly what I was talking about when I delivered a lecture. Take, for example, this response. There were three reform acts in the 19th century, but it was still a first parcel post system. I agreed with the student that there were indeed three parliamentary reform acts, 1832, 67 and 84, but even then there was no proportional representation. It was still a first past the post voting system where candidates with the most vote was elected as member of parliament. In the next case, one misspelled vowel made all the difference. After 1872, people could now vote in a secret voting bath. Oh, I could have had such fun with that. Would you vote for a wet liberal or a Tory drip? But I didn't labor the point. Instead, I wrote, I think you mean a booth. The next pupil sort of understood the concept of first past the post, but obviously hadn't a clue what it really meant. The first past the post electoral system was undemocratic as it wasn't fair on people who couldn't run very fast. I explained the concept more thoroughly, saying to the girl that she should really pay more attention in class to what I was teaching and not let her mind wander off when I was trying to explain something. Mr. Jimison, she interrupted, are those new curtains you've got in your room? At the next parents' night, I gently and diplomatically informed the mother that her daughter could be somewhat unfocused and easily lost concentration. The mother looked at me and said, Mr. Jimison, is that a new car you've bought? Lack of focus apart. Another problem with teaching history to young folk is their likelihood to display an anachronism, something placed in the wrong era of time. 
such as this genuine comment, the railways were invented to take the strain off the motorways. I patiently wrote a correction explaining that railways were first constructed in the 1830s and 40s, and the first motorway built in Britain was the M1, which was opened to traffic in the late 1950s. Our M9 was opened in 1970. This is a rather more complex anachronism. Can you see where the candidate's coming from? Lenin died in 1924, either in St. Petersburg or Petrograd, or maybe it was Leningrad. She was correct in saying that Vladimir Lenin died in, <coughs> in 1924, but he actually died in his Gorky mansion in the suburbs of Moscow. She was also correct that St. Petersburg had changes of name to Petrograd in 1914 and Leningrad in 1924. I explained the concept of an anachronism to my classes and later in a class test, asked them to define the word. One young lad, usually a very bright student wrote, an anachronism is something that could not have happened until after it did. Well, you can see what he's getting at. And of course, it isn't only in a school exam situation where anachronisms occur. They abound in movies, the directors of which don't seem to think that accurate history really matters. Don't get me started on Braveheart. Suffice it now for me to say that no 13th century warrior ever wore a kilt. They don't appear as an item of Highland dress until the 16th century. And just as another example of countless others, In the Green Mile, a movie I still love incidentally, the use of the electric chair is totally anachronistic. It was not used in the state where the film is set, that is Louisiana, in the 1930s, the time period of the production. And then there's a German shepherd dog in Gladiator. The breed originates from the early 1800s and so on. Even organizations you'd expect to be historically correct sometimes get it wrong. In 2015, the Royal Mint produced a two pound coin celebrating the 800th anniversary of the signing of the Magna Carta. On the coin is a representation of King John wielding a quill, a schoolboy error. Kings never signed official documents. They always ratified it by use of the royal seal. And on the right is a, a recent Russian commemorative coin depicting the 1945 meeting of Soviet and American troops at Torgau in Germany. Can you see what's wrong here? It's perhaps a moot point, but it depicts a 50 star US flag, when at that time, 1945, the real American flag had only 48 stars. These types of anachronism are correctly called parachronisms, where something appears in the wrong time period. Even Shakespeare was guilty of that, when in Julius Caesar, he has Brutus say, peace, count the clock, to which Cassius responds, the clock has stricken three. Clocks were common in Shakespeare's time, but certainly hadn't been invented at the time of the Roman Empire in 44 BC. The Romans used sundials or water timers. The biggest parachronistic problems in schools arose when pupils were obliged to write a short imaginative essay, as in the O-grade history exam, up until it was replaced by standard grade in 1986. And as I was on the committee that devised the S grade history exam, I was at the forefront of asking, begging for the imagination essay to be removed. They were impossible to mark. Putting aside the myriad language anachronisms, for example, putting modern vocabulary in the words of a historic character, the most frequent problems were caused by parachronisms. One example was the 1984 O-grade exam, which asked students to imagine that you are a suffragette, write about a day in your life. One of my pupils began her response, well, it was the day of the big race, and I knew that I would kill myself at it. I had told all my friends on social media what I was going to do. It was a great idea to imagine yourself as Emily Davison on Derby Day 1913, but the student obviously could not imagine life without a cell phone. 
another O grade item asked the candidate to imagine life as a Scottish farmer in the late 18th century. And again, the pupil almost got it right. I farm on several small strips of land, each divided by a balk. We are all poor, so we share what farming tools we have. There is only one tractor between us, so each of us takes a turn. Interestingly, the marking instructions, which I actually wrote, were to award positive credit and not to fail the child if they got something completely wrong. So the pupil got one mark for explaining run rig farming, another mark for using the term balk for the area of wasteland between each rig, another mark for the idea of subsistence farmers sharing equipment like a plough or a horse. So that's three out of eight already. She just needed one more point to pass. And in fact, having written more, she scored six out of eight. So the imagination essay was scrapped, but it hasn't stopped anachronisms. A genuine statement I received read, in 1914, young men were persuaded to join up for the army by radio appeals. Not in 1914, radio broadcasts began in a very limited way in 1922. At least the writer didn't mention television. And this is a photograph of young men from Linlithgow volunteering for the army in 1914. A favorite topic taught in most Scottish schools was the period just before World War I, the time of the liberal reforms. And here are some genuine academy answers and my corrections. Nobody knew how poor people were till two people wrote their books. Um, not much detail there. You are referring, I think, to Charles Booth and Seaboam Roundtree, whose publications opened many eyes as to the scale of poverty in England in the late 19th century. And another, a famous book showed how poor people couldn't afford chocolate. It was called the Rowan Tree Book. As I wrote the response, I remember cracking a lame joke in class about the Roundtree family producing a product that poor people couldn't afford. And how sad that was as chocolate makes everyone happy. The comment had backfired on me. Another answer in the same topic was, in his work wandering around York, Roundtree even found a teacher living in poverty. Even a teacher. Was she being sarcastic, I wondered. I thought to myself, even at three times the average worker's salary in the late 19th century, many teachers would be on the breadline with an average yearly income of 150 pounds, about 12,000 in today's terms. And here's another response to a, an item about the reforms carried out by the Liberal government in the early 20th century. The Liberals rounded up many bad children and put them in Bastilles. Did she mean, I thought, like the child catcher in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, but I never wrote that. Here's what I did say, the Liberal government of 1906 did set up juvenile courts and separate prisons for child offenders. They were called Borstals, after a village in Kent where the first one was set up. I always tried to encourage children to express their own views on historical subjects, and believe me, I got them. The Liberal government introduced free school meals for children. Personally, I don't think they should be thanked for this. I know I'm sure that many schools do serve delicious school lunches. So my response to that writer was, I assume you are not keen on school lunches, or perhaps you are rightly questioning how effective this reform was. The scheme was means tested, and only about half of local authorities introduced the scheme. However, by 1914, some 14 million meals had been provided for hungry school children allowing them to study properly. Another pupil expressed her opinion, inadvertently making a good point and then undoing it a bit. The Children's Act of 1908 made it offensive for young people to smoke, but I think this is taking away personal freedom to choose. I replied, the Children's Charter made it an offence for shopkeepers to sell tobacco or alcohol to children under 16. Police could seize cigarettes from anyone under that age. However, you are correct in saying that seeing young people smoking is offensive to many people. Don't you agree? 
Another popular subject was women's rights. Let's look at some examples of responses received on that subject. Women had no power in the 19th century, only men could legally commit adultery. I wrote, I'm not sure what you mean here. The Matrimonial Causes Act of 1857 gave men only the right to divorce their wives on the grounds of adultery. Married women were not able to obtain a divorce if they discovered that their husbands had been unfaithful. Another pupil wrote, some women didn't even bat an eyelid when they pleased their husbands. It was their duty. I was so tempted, so tempted to comment further on that, but all I did write was, you are correct in saying that women were expected to obey their husbands and accept their inferiority. If pupils found written sources difficult to evaluate, picture sources could be even more problematic. Here's an example from an S grade paper. How useful is source A as evidence of women's rights in the 19th century? And it's from a political leaflet published in 1904. Interestingly, I received quite different responses from boys and girls. The male response above uh, tended to be like that one. Source A is useful as it is a primary source drawn at the time when women had no rights, R-I-T-E-S. It's really good as it shows how men had women tied up in knots, N-O-T-S. She is gagged and cannot argue with her husband. Hmm. A genuine female response went typical. This is useless as it shows a lady has been tied up by her fat husband who likes to think he's the boss. I commented that indeed it is a primary source and therefore reflects the opinion of many women at the time. The lady is indeed tied up, not sure about the knots. Uh, the bindings around her representing the limitations and legalities which restricted her, her rights, R-I-G-H-T-S, and kept her subject to her husband. On the same topic of women's rights, here's another absolutely genuine answer. Nancy Astor was the first woman to find a seat in Parliament, but every time she left her seat, Nancy had to walk half a kilometre to visit another chamber and find a seat where she could pee. She came back looking very flushed and tired. I liked the play on words. I'm not sure, mind you, if it was intended. And I bowed to that other pupil's superior opinion of how far toilets were in the House of Commons. The topic, of course, included the suffragettes, not quite the spelling as shown here. And I've combined here, I have to admit, three responses into one answer. The answer to the question, what tactics were used to try to obtain votes for women? The suffragettes were led by Mrs. Emmeline Pantshart, she was constantly breaching the peace. When she tried to pull down the prime minister's trousers, he was outraged and thought very little of the rude activity. Uh, or perhaps more correctly, Mrs. Emmeline Pankhurst, uh, and I think she meant breaching the peace. They did do aggressive actions. I've never heard of the trousers incident, however. They usually broke windows, planted bombs, or chained themselves to railings. Although Prime Minister Asquith, was attacked in his car by four women as he passed through Bannockburn in Stirlingshire. They threw red pepper and one brandished a whip. My students were always interested in Emily Davison and the Derby Day incident referred to previously. Here are some genuine, again, I admit, combined comments. One suffragette threw herself under the King's horse, but she died for nothing as the King wasn't even riding it. After Emily Davidson, all the pupils called her Davidson, it's Davidson, did her thing. Winston Churchill said, their cause has went backward. All over Britain, suffragettes began to smash windows and throw themselves under horses. Well, Emily Davidson did die after leaping in front of a horse owned by King George V. The jockey Herbert Jones was injured in the fall. And I doubt if that great orator Churchill would have said went backward. He actually did say their cause has marched backwards. And what an image was presented here, breaking windows, yes, but only one woman threw herself under a horse. There was not mass suicide under horses' hooves. 
Hunger striking was another topic that children found fascinating. One teenager writing, when suffragettes refused to eat, the police started pouring soup down their nostrils. My response went, you mean they were force fed in prison by putting a tube in their nose and down into their stomach, after which liquid nourishment was poured in, usually milk and whipped eggs or beef tea. And it was done by prison warders with a doctor in attendance. The role of women in World War I was another popular topic. Here is one genuine submission. During the war, women took up the important role of boosting soldiers up the front. They certainly showed the men what they were made of, quite. But I assume she meant that women took on the important role of keeping the troops spirits high and boosting their morale. Women, of course, rolled up their sleeves and kept the country going. Another one, during the war, suffragettes and normal women took up many jobs that only men could do. And I think there's a couple of uh, politically incorrect statements there. And that takes us on to World War I itself. Here, apparently, is how it began in a genuine response. The First World War was, began when somebody shot Frank the Archduck. As he died, he told his wife, keep breathing for the Wayne's sake. Well, the pupil was right when she said that the assassination at Sarajevo was the spark that later ignited World War I. Archduke Franz Ferdinand was hit in the neck his wife Sophie was shot in the stomach and his last words to her were, Sophie dear, don't die, stay alive for our children, not the Wayne sake. This poster was published by the Parliamentary Recruiting Commission in London in 1915. The students were asked, how useful is this poster as evidence of recruiting in World War I? And here is one genuine attempt. It's useful as it shows a proud Scottish soldier standing erect and pointing to his house in a village where he may have a wife, a child, and even a family pet. Well, the marking instruction actually read, this is a World War I recruiting poster showing a soldier. Is he Scottish? I think the kilt may be an Irish kilt. Looking at it carefully asking if the British way of life is not worth fighting for. If it is, then young men should heed their country's call and join the army. It's a primary source dating from the time during World War I and designed to make young men answer the call to fight. The most commonly taught topic in Scotland is the failure of the Weimar Republic and the rise of the Nazi party. One student had his own reason for the Nazis' success. In the 1920s, with beer at 15 million marks a pint, the Germans were desperate and voted Nazi. Well, I replied, I know what you mean. Hyperinflation in Germany after World War I resulted in crazy prices for all commodities. Bread cost 250 marks for a loaf in January 1923, but it had risen to 200,000 million marks for a loaf in November 1923. One pupil must have remembered seeing these illustrations in a class lecture I gave, for he wrote in his exam, the Germans didn't have big enough pockets, so they pushed their money about in wheelbarrows. There was just so much of it. Young folk, you know, have an odd attitude to Hitler. To my generation, influenced by my parents and their generation, he was pure evil. In this PC woke world, you get comments like this. Hitler was insecure, a strange, deranged, spoilt creature who constantly went about shouting words like smash, bash, and crush. I replied a very graphic description, but perhaps better put that Hitler had many extreme beliefs and often shouted them at mass rallies where he used aggressive, passionate language. Here's another genuine pupil effort. Hitler wanted to create a new race of Germans. After one unforgettable Nuremberg rally, 900 girls returned home pregnant. I bet that was unforgettable, but the pupil was correct. After the 1936 Nuremberg rally, 900 members of the League of German Maidens, aged between 15 and 18, were pregnant. 
But although the Nazis wanted the population to rise, many were not pleased at this breach of morality. And the next year, camping for Lee girls was forbidden. Another picture source to be evaluated, the exam question being, to what extent does this 1934 photograph of the members of the League of German Maidens show how the Nazis attracted young girls? Two genuine answers I got to that. It shows young women with their chests proudly thrust out, showing they were chuffed to bits to be members of the Nazi girl guides. Mm -hmm, well, uh, and the other one, this picture is not in color, so I can't tell if they all have blonde hair and blue eyes like Hitler wanted. What was actually wanted by the exam board, because I wrote the, um, in the marking instructions, girls were attracted to a uniformed organization that enabled them to be part of a close group and they liked what it offered, friendship, sport, gymnastics, but it did indoctrinate them into Nazi beliefs. It also reinforced the domestic nature expected of women. The Nazis believed that the Aryans had the most pure blood of all the people on earth, and the ideal Aryan had pale skin, blonde hair, and blue eyes. And what about Nazi men? Well, apparently, according to one student, they liked the youth movements where Hitler took all young boys camping. I remark Hitler didn't actually do that himself, but he was keen on German boys being brought up healthy and full of Nazi ideas. Hitler Jugend encouraged boys to go to state organized camps where they were trained as future soldiers for the Nazi cause. In January 1933, there were 50,000 members of Hitler Youth. By the end of that year, there were more than 2 million. Here's another response, this time to the item, comment on the leaders of Nazi Germany. True answer. The Nazi leaders were a sorry bunch. Joe Balls was deformed, Hess was mad, Goering was overweight, and Bormann was a weedy wee chap. What could I say? I mean, Joseph Goebbels, perhaps he got the name slightly wrong, did have a club foot. Hess certainly displayed erratic behavior. Goering was not always fat. He had been a First World War air ace, but when captured in 1945, he weighed over 18 stone uh, and he was addicted to food and morphine. Martin Bormann was a short squat man in a badly fitting uniform who drank heavily. And as for the Italian leader, I smiled at this reply. Mussolini didn't have the guts to be a butcher like Hitler. Nice play on words, not intended. And he didn't use nasty policemen <coughs> like what Hitler did. Mussolini's fascism was very like Nazism. Both were one party, totalitarian states. The Italian version was still brutal with mass killings in Ethiopia and the persecution of Italy's Jewish population. Mussolini did use the Italian secret police. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> he did use the <coughs> Italian secret police <coughs> called the Ovra, but they weren't quite as brutal as the Gestapo. <coughs> Another very popular higher topic was appeasement. But even at higher level, some odd comments were produced, such as to get peace, Chamberlain carried an umbrella and went about waving it and saying things, sorting things out. But I wouldn't like you to think that was a typical higher candidate response. Here is one. Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain was often seen during the crisis in Europe in the late 1930s, carrying a rolled umbrella, probably to make him appear as a peaceful English businessman. Later on, he was mocked as the umbrella man who gave in to Hitler's demands. And lastly, a couple of responses to higher questions on the Second World War. Appeasement had failed and World War II began, during which many British children were evaporated. <laughs> the pupil meant, of course, evacuated, moved to places which were less likely to be bombed. The question here was, compared to World War I, what were casualty figures like in World War II? World War II deaths were not as great as World War I. Mr. Jimison told us that probably the biggest killers in the British Army were the kooks. Folks, it, it was a joke, a joke. <laughs>
Some pupils, of course, never ever completed a written task set for them and thus avoided committing any blunder. I remember one lad who, when asked where his homework essay was, replied that it was still in his pen. <laughs> Laterally, pupils were allowed to type out their submission on a computer with a spell checker. I mentioned to one girl that she should not write Henry number eight, but more correctly, Henry V111. I can't do that, sir, she replied. My computer has regular numbers on it, no Roman numerals. And on that happy remark, that's it. I hope you've enjoyed the small blunders and have learned a little bit of history along the way. I'd like to think that all the students whose work you've seen learned something, that their appreciation of the past increased and that they develop transferable skills for the future, studying evidence, weighing up conflicting material, interpreting facts, evaluating truth, developing empathy. For I sincerely believe history does matter. I hope you agree. And thank you so much for logging on, many of you, to many of my presentations. Do stay on if you want to tell me something or ask a question or just chat. Otherwise, good night and thanks again.